Hi, Wine Delusters, and in this episode, we're heading up to the scenic rim and Gold Coast hinterland. Welcome to the Wine Delust podcast. My name's Janine, and I run a wine events business in Canberra. But my real passion is travel, and my bucket list is to travel to every wine region in the world. In this series, I'll be exploring some regional Aussie wine destinations. I'll give you some tips whether you're planning a romantic getaway, a girls' weekend, or you're dragging the kids along. Pour yourself a glass, and let's get exploring. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're talking about today, the Wangeri Bura people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So we've all heard about the Gold Coast. It's Australia's playground. It's famous for sunshine and surf, and it's full of theme parks for the kids and nightlife for the adults. But did you know there's a wine region right nearby? Less than an hour from the hustle and bustle of the Gold Coast is the beautiful Mount Tambourine area. There's some wineries and several cellar doors, among many other things to see and do there. The place name of Tambourine comes from the local Indigenous language meaning wild lime, referring to finger limes in the area. Witches Fall is a section of Mount Tambourine, which was declared a national park way back in 1908. It was actually the first national park in Queensland and only the second national park declared in Australia. The area is remnants of a volcano that erupted some 23 million years ago, and it still shows the legacy of cliffs, rocky outcrops and waterfalls. This region is home to about 85% of all the animal species found in the Gold Coast area. There are several different roads that you can take up the mountain, and there's some really beautiful views over the Gold Coast area all the way to the ocean. I really recommend the drive. So what wines to try? As Queensland is warm and it's fairly humid, it's not your typical wine growing region. But Queensland has actually six different wine regions, part of the Vine and Shine Trail. In general, these regions pride themselves on producing alternative varieties. So whatever's going, give it a go and I'm sure you'll find something you'll like. My first guest today is Judy. She's a sommelier and she's the manager at Cedar Creek Estate Vineyard and Winery. Cedar Creek produce all their own grapes on site. They've chosen grapes that work well in this warmer climate and from these they can make many different styles. Judy has lived on the mountain for most of her life and she just loves it as you'll be able to tell from the passion that she brings to our chat. Welcome Judy from Cedar Creek Estate Vineyard and Winery. Welcome, Judy, to the Wine de Lust podcast. Um, Thank you very much. Very excited being on my home turf of the Gold Coast. Who knew that there was these wineries literally 45 minutes up the hill behind the coast? Queensland's hidden oasis. Well, I've lived here on the mountain for 37 years, and my husband and I have always enjoyed wine. I have watched the wine in this area grow. Uh, Many people say the area on top of the mountain here is not conducive to growing grapes, but we're living testimony here at Cedar Creek. We are the only vineyard on the mountain that grow our own grapes and make our own wine. But when it comes down to it, I think it's really passion and dollars and hard work, Mm. you know? There's no two ways about it. And last year, We lost all our home fruit here. We got 1.5 metres of rain in 48 hours. So it's not an easy journey at all. But the owner here is John Penglis. He's a fantastic guy. He's done so many things for the local community here. And here at Cedar Creek, we planted the vines here in 1994. Mm -hmm. And he has just gone from strength to strength. He really is one of the pioneers, I guess you'd say, for the mountain area here. And he's proved everybody wrong. Vineyard does have its trials and tribulations, but then every place does. Yes, definitely. If you grow fruit for the hot, humid climate, then you're going to get good fruit. You know, it's just like down south. If you grow fruit for 
the colder conditions, you're going to get good fruit. Yeah. So what, what grapes do you grow here? Chambasin. Yes. Yeah, the mainstay here. It's a very thick, red-skinned grape that is the only one out of the 10,000 different grape varieties in the world to make grapes from mm. that has red flesh as well. Didn't so we able then to do many different things yes. with it. And we do a wine here that we call Revelation Red. And it started out as a mistake <laughs> because back in uh, the year 2000, which was the first harvest, commercial harvest here, John saw up the road because um, not far up the road was actually the first vineyard planted here on the mountain. And the guy, Roger, that originally planted it passed away. And uh, of course, the young ones coming through didn't want the, um, to carry on. So they sold it and it's not the same anymore. Of course, the netting of the vines, John didn't want to net the vines because he could see the birds getting caught up in the nets and he loves the nature. Yeah. So he said, no, I'm not going to put nets on the vines. So the rainbow lorikeets from Corumban <laughs> Bird Sanctuary ascended upon the vines here and consumed four tonne of fruit in a week. <laughs> so um, they didn't even get lift off. They were so, uh, so drunk from consuming all the fruit. So uh, John put the word out, the fruit got to the locals to come help pick, get the fruit off the vines. And the winemaker at the time was Peter Scudmore Smith. He's a master oh. of wines. Mm -hmm. And we only have seven masters in Australia. Mm. He's one of seven. And when he saw the fruit, he said, well, what the hell am I gonna do with this? Because it wasn't at its full ripeness, but John said, well, I want you to make a wine and a bloody good one, thank you very much. <laughs> so that's when Revelation Red was born. And it is our Chambasin. It's made from the flesh of the grape only. Oh. And it is sweet to the palate to start off with. And it has a dry finish. Nice. It's beautiful with pepperoni pizza. Mm. It's uh, our signature wine. Now John leaves two rows of vines unnetted every year to say thank you to the birds. <laughs> That's fantastic. I was going to say, because you do have a few of the favourites, like your Shiraz, yes. um, Sem Sav Blanc, yes. but then you've got some alternatives like Videlo and, and your mm. Chambasin you were just mentioning. Yep. And I was just going to say there's some intriguing names. So you've told us about Revelation Red. Yes. And, um, and then there's Seduction. Yes. It's another red that we make from the Chambasin. We cut the fermentation, a bit like Moscato. It... During a Moscato, Moscato is a style of wine that is always sweet, mm. can be made from any grape variety, but the fermentation mm. is stopped to keep that residual sweetness right. into the wine and stop the alcohol content from getting too high. And so that's what's done with the seduction, to keep the alcohol content low. Yep. And people just love it. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. The Revelation Red is higher in alcohol, just like a late harvest can be higher in alcohol. But the seduction is the lighter one. And uh, we sold out before Christmas. We have to wait now till after the next harvest, but it really is. It's like um, alcoholic Ribena. <laughs> I can see how that would be popular. <laughs> Very popular. Very popular. On site, you've also the Queensland Wine Centre. Yes. So can you tell so us? So before COVID and before all these natural disasters, Queensland Wine Centre was opened up to reach out to some of the premier wineries throughout Queensland. There mm -hmm. was 192 vineyards throughout Queensland at the time. Through all the weather and health events that have occurred, uh, we've lost 50 vineyards wow. in total in Queensland huge. that are not coming back online, mm. which is very sad. It's not advertised. People don't know about it. People don't know really about Queensland wine that very much at all. If at all, they hear about the Granite Belt. The mm. Granite Belt is the largest grape growing area of Queensland. But there are several other smaller areas of Queensland that do grow grapes and thrive, really. Uh, North Burnett, South Burnett, 
we have many little areas. We've actually put, John's put a map up of Queensland under glass out here on our veranda and got all the wineries listed and all the uh, areas on the map circled. There are still a lot of vineyards around I, in Queensland. I, I urge local folk and particularly as domestic tourism seems to have taken on mm. with a, an extra bang to really get out there and explore the local wine areas of Queensland because they are beautiful yeah. areas and they really are surrounded by subtropical, well in our area here, subtropical rainforest. But, you know, all over, wherever you find the wine areas, they usually are surrounded by gorgeous scenery. Yeah, so it, you can't go wrong. If you seek out the local vineyards, you're seeking out a beautiful area yeah. of Queensland. So you um, have representation of different wines from all over Queensland We were, well. yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, now, because of this weather event, None of the vineyards except for Ballandine Estate and Moffatdale Ridge have uh, enough fruit to supply as wholesale yeah. for us to help represent them. But when they're all back online again, I'm sure that will all come back into fruition again because John is only too pleased to create that buzz for the, the industry neighbouring. Yeah neighbouring wines yeah yeah so as i was saying this is um cedar creek estate has heaps going on here Absolutely. so you've got the cellar door yes some queensland wine center other wines yes. but you've also do like a it's a wedding venue oh absolutely the property itself is divided into many different areas it's like a mini destination yeah. really there's glowworm caves that john had man built but during the drought time, the natural glowworms in the rainforest were dying oh. because there wasn't enough moisture to keep the natural glowworms surviving. So John came up with the idea of creating an environment that the glowworms would survive in the daytime for visitors to come visit yeah. instead of people trampling through the bush through the night um, mm. and destroying the natural flora of the rainforest and they've been so successful our glowworm caves here really proven themselves over and over again they're now um, up and running very very successfully they've got a new team that have just taken them to the next level and it's a family owned and operated business now john has passed it on and it really is uh, part of the property indeed and worth visiting. They've also created a frog hollow. Yes, I saw which, that. Yeah. Uh, there's 26 different species of frog that live in and around Tambury Mountain. So um, many of those species are in the hollow for people to have a look at and see. Believe it or not, Queensland does have frogs, not just cane toads. <laughs> So uh, thank goodness for that. Thank right? goodness, I agree. No. So the whole family sorted. Mum and Dad can come and do a wine tasting. Absolutely, and, yeah. and that usually the... is what happens. You know, people come, they don't even realise that there's wine here, and either Mum or Dad end up taking the kids to the through the glowworms, and both Mum and Dad go to the glowworms, and then both Mum and Dad come through for a tipple afterwards. <laughs> so everyone is happy. Then, we, of course, we've got the restaurant and takeaway food as well, coffee next door as well. So it's all here, one-stop shop as far as all yeah, that and is some, concerned. I do think that coming to the Gold Coast is wonderful, but then detouring for a night or two up here would be a oh, really wonderful absolutely. way to sort of put There's an B&Bs just, you know, walking distance from here, 50 metres from mm. here. There's beautiful Witches Force cottages up on the corner. There's cottages all over the place. It, it really is very easy to come up and stay over and enjoy the tranquility of what a subtropical rainforest has to offer. Yeah, and um, some gorgeous views down to the Gold oh, Coast. Lovely. Like it is stunning on the Outstanding. drive up. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's great. 
Is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about? Sydney? Well, I, I thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to talk about Cedar Creek Estate and bring our little area here to the light of your audience. If anyone wants to find us, they can find us online. All the W's, cedarcreekestate.com.au. We do have a shop online. I ship our wines all over Australia. So have a look. You can yeah. do a virtual tour online. Wine tasting, so if you're visiting the coast, people call me a bit of a guru. Uh, my name is Judy, of course, and uh, I'm around here pretty much most of the time. I am a sommelier by trade these days, so I can match food and wine oh, and try to show people the correct way to taste wine. I know everyone can drink wine, yes. but tasting wine is a bit of an art form. And if people would like to know more about that, they're more than, more than welcome to come on in here and find out about it. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Judy. That's You're been very great. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. My next guest is Wren. She's the winemaker at Witches Fall Winery. I love her story about becoming a winemaker. And it shows that if you follow your interests, sometimes you can be at the right place at the right time. She also talked me through a tasting and you'll hear about some of the wines here. Welcome Wren from Witches Fall Winery. Welcome, Ren, to the Wine Delust podcast. You're the winemaker out here at Witches Fall Winery up in beautiful Mount Tambourine. I am. <laughs> <laughs> the history is that the family moved up from the Hunter Valley. Yeah, that's right. So John and Kim Hessop are the two owners here, and John's been winemaker uh, for 25 plus years now. And before then, they were living in Hunter Valley um, and working down there, and then previous to that in the Barossa as well. Oh, wow. Mm. And so do you know what brought them up to southeast Queensland? I think it's a bit of family, a bit of weather, a bit of fun, just a bit of everything. And also the region up here is an incredibly amazing growing region out of the Granite Belt. And locating the winery here was a very strategic move to kind of bridge the gap between Granite Belt and the populations nearby. So yeah. we, we're lucky enough to have Brisbane, Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast, Byron, all within a two hour radius. Witches Falls is now almost 20 years old. We're 20 years old this year. And we've been doing alternative varieties since day dot. So it's definitely like part of our portfolio and part of our identity um, and our personality in winemaking. The manager, Helen, was just telling me that you've got some pecorino that you're growing on site here. Yeah, those are our little baby vines. They're only about two years old, so we're not cropping just yet. We're still focusing on, you know, training roots and structure. But really amazing variety, and we're hoping it does really well up here. It's got quite a bit of natural resistance to a few things that... You know, we, we battle against up here in the rainforest, not a, you know, yeah. a normal region for growing like the grapes. the humidity, I guess, is the big one. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we also have, so we have really old volcanic fertile soils oh. up here, which grapes don't actually like. Oh, <laughs> grapes, right. Grapes like unfertile soils, generally. And so, because Pecorino is an Italian variety, and I've had mm. a few recently, and I've really enjoyed them. So yeah, it's, it's amazing, crisp white, lots of acidity and vibrancy. It's should go really well for Queensland drinking as well. And mm -hmm. when do you expect your first harvest of that one? It's, it's hard to tell because we're, we're growing on unusual soils up here. So we're, we're, we'll probably get a crop next year. I'm not sure what we'll do with it yet. Yeah. But, <laughs> but generally you can you can bank on about six to eight years for your first proper crop. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I'm mm. looking forward to trying that. Me too. Got a few different groupings of your wines. Um, we so do. This is the yeah. Provenance one? That's right. So we have a couple of ranges of wines. Provenance is basically a celebration of the regions that um, the grapes are grown in. Then we go on to our Wild Ferment range. So this is a range that's probably like one of our flagships and probably what we're most well known for. And we've been doing that since day dot as well. So back in 2003, when we first started, um, we were you know pioneers in the country along with Yolamba um, doing Wild Ferment, which uh -huh. basically just means you know, not adding yeast in and just using the natural yeast that lives there. On your website, you've got such great words around, it's the heart of your winemaking. Yeah, The wild definitely. fermentation. Yeah. So. It's definitely part of our identity is now wrapped up in the idea of wild ferment and, you know, staying a bit truer to the grapes. And I think one of the, the ways to express wild ferment is through, you know, the tricky term that, you know, everyone likes to yeah. ignore, terroir. Right, so this is, you know, the sense of a place and the growing conditions and the winemaking conditions and all of this. And, and when you're adding commercial yeast into a ferment, you're kind of bumping out a lot of the wild indigenous stuff that happens mm. to a grape through ferment. Yep. Whereas when you're doing a wild fermentation, 
you actually naturally get a lot more of the expression of you know other bacteria the natural yeasts all different strains of them expressing in the wine at the end oh that's yeah. exciting so it's the granite belt and riverlands is where you source your grapes primarily from yeah that's it so traditionally it's always been from granite belt so up here in queensland however in 2020 when it was you know yeah. just an awful year for everyone especially wine industry um the granite belt was hit by drought first and very extreme drought um and then it was hit by um, flooding and then bushfires. Yes, <laughs> so yes. just all three at once and it meant that we got um, 2% of our normal yield that mm-hmm. year which was awful it and is, we would have is. had to close and you know lay people off and do all these dreadful things that we had you know no hopes of doing. Yeah. <laughs> but luckily um, John, owner and winemaker here, he um, kind of saw the writing on the wall with that happening um, and got in pretty early, um, reached out through a bunch of old uni mates um, wow. to find someone else with some yeah. fruit going. <laughs> I mean, everything that Ash Ratcliffe with Ricotera is doing down there is just incredible. So he's a pioneer in that region at the moment. He's doing basically all climate-adaptive fruit, sustainably grown, with a big focus on alternative varieties. Yeah. And to have all of those three things, you know, in one sentence, just lined up with everything that we're trying to do here. And so since then, we've just continued that relationship. Oh, excellent. Mm. Yeah, now look how big your wine list is. You've got so many exciting grapes on there. Yeah, it's it's very exciting when we have people come in and be like, I haven't heard of half of this. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I feel really privileged that I get to, you know, run a cellar and, you know, coordinate grapes coming and going and see how they develop and mature and, you know, make all the calls on that and and work in such a beautiful place where, you know, we're friends with everyone. And yeah. <laughs> and do you live on Mount Tambourine? Yeah, yeah, my husband and I moved up here, is it four years ago, five years ago now? So when you got work, started working here? Yeah, that's, that's kind of how it started. So um, we just moved up to the community. Um, Sam's parents had lived up here for about a decade before anyway. Um, so we're kind of familiar with it, but hadn't lived up here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just got a job here on the weekend just to kind of make some friends and say hello to people. Um, and it just all snowballed from there. <laughs> well, so you started becoming a winemaker because of your job in the cellar door. Yep, that's it. That's so there was an opportunity that came open out the back and something or other else fell through out here. And I was like, well, pick me. <laughs> I had no experience or skills or anything like that. So within you know four to five years, I've now gone from knowing absolutely nothing about winemaking. I knew a bit about wine, luckily. Yeah. I'd travelled quite a lot and I'd always been, you know, very passionate about the wine industry, but just hadn't really known what the pathways in wine were at that point. Um, and when this one just opened up, it was just, you know, good timing. And luckily, John and Kim gave me a shot and they supported me through my studies and um, just slowly handed over more and more responsibility and I, I now get to call myself a winemaker. How fantastic. Congratulations. That's such a Feels that's good. So wonderful, isn't it? But in the meantime, we've got some, we're starting off with some Vidello. Absolutely. So yeah. Vidello, this comes from Granite Belt. So Granite Belt is like the area of Stanthorpe and it's the coldest region in Queensland. So it's about somewhere between 700 to 1,200 metres above sea level, which is quite a lot. Yes. Um, so we're about 500 up here on Mount Tambourine. So right. you go basically double that for the average of Granite Belt. And that elevation means that it's a cool climate growing region. So Vidello is probably probably the number one um, wine that is associated with the Granite Belt. So it's probably their, their signature. So it grows really well there. And Vidello is an amazing grape. And it's just perfectly suited for not just Queensland drinking, but Australian um, afternoons in the sunshine, by the beach, um, with a bucket of prawns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you throw your nose in, yeah, you'll immediately pick up. It's a bit grassy. It's a bit green. It's nice and citrusy. Yeah. It's got all of those like beautiful, light, bright, vibrant notes going for it, and it just makes it one of those drinks that it goes down a little mm. bit too well sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, it smells beautiful. Mm. You know, give it a swill as well. On palate, like it's clean and crisp, exactly like yeah. we were talking about with the nose and all those scents of citrus and. But you get these lovely notes of lime and pineapple that come through. A nice dry finish too. Absolutely. Yeah. So basically all of our wines here are dry except for our Moscato and our dessert wines. So they're definitely not lacking fruit though. So no. you, you wouldn't be mistaken for thinking that it, you know, maybe, oh, you would associate that with a bit of sweetness. But there's, they're all dry and it's just the intensity of the fruit flavours coming through. Yeah. <laughs> that is very easy to drink. So next up is Nero d'Avila. And is this, oh, it's from Riverlands. I can see on the label. Mm-hmm. So originally it comes from, generally it's, you know, it's most famous in Sicily um, and probably the yummiest ones that you'd find mm. there around Manetna, the um, the volcano there. Yes. Which is super cool. 
This one, totally different growing conditions. So everything that you know about Mount Etna, um, <laughs> Nero Davila, just forget. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this is very continental instead of you know volcanic and maritime. This is inland, which is riverland, um, and we're talking generally some sandy, loamy soils for riverland um, and a bit of red clay as well. Mm. So expression of this is very different. Um, color is fantastic. It is. Um, and you'll notice it as well, like immediately with nose too, it just absolutely jumps. The intensity on it is really quite big. Yeah. yeah. And without doubt, like this to me, I haven't even smelt it yet, but I just have such association with this wine. <gasps> but this to me is cherry ripe. Yes. All yes, the yes. elements of it. So you get the cherries, you get the little bits of chocolate in there, and you even get like the coconutty stuff mm. too. Mm. But it's actually it's quite spicy now as well. Yes. It's, it's really grown quite a bit of spice and mm. as it's settling into bottle and, you know, transforming and changing in there. So, Tinta Barocca. So yes. this is a grape that comes from Portugal, generally from the Douro Valley. So this is Portuguese grape growing, so we're talking a warmer climate, mm -hmm. very well suited to Riverland. Tinta Barocca can be made in two ways. So as a dry red, a table red, like what we're drinking now, but also as a fortified, so as port. Right. And we've actually done both. We thought, you know, yeah. if they're doing it over there, there must be a good reason. Why don't we do it here as well? Yeah. Um, so when we get our um, harvest come in, we actually split a portion aside and we fortify. So that's maturing in barrel at the moment, and I think our first vintage is about three years um, along yeah. now. Maybe end of this year, we might think about bottling that one and releasing that as a, uh, a single varietal fortified, but also equally as nice as a dry table wine as well. Because I've heard of Tarika, but I had not heard of this one. Oh, mm. okay. Portuguese varietals will, will probably come into Ooh. their own in the next little while in Australia. Portugal and Spain have very similar growing regions mm. um, to Australia in a lot of areas. Yes. We're now moving up into, you know, the climate adaptive, climate suited yeah. plantings. Yeah. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? It's nice, isn't it? It's um, it's dry. Yes. Nice and like tight at the yeah, back there to give yes. it a bit of like oomph, mm. um, which we find goes really quite well with food. So this will probably age. I'm guessing for. A It'll age really yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. A, a lot of these wines will. And it will round mm. out. And, yeah. and, it, and it's quite higher um, alcohol as well. So we're talking 14.9%. Right. Wow. Which yeah. gives it a bit of oomph and a bit of like heat, which will kind of mellow out with a bit of time. But also means that, it, like you're right, it will cellar really well. Mm. So all of that, you know, vibrancy and oomph that you get with that, that'll kind of mature and soften with a little bit of time too. Yeah. Not, not all wines are made for cellaring, and there's no. you know, always that <laughs> argument with people that, oh, should I give it you know, 10 years for a, you know, <laughs> a light stainless steel vibrant white? And you go, no, no. Yes, yes. <laughs> Generally, most wines are made to drink now. Yes. <laughs> this is Lambrusco. Oh, my goodness. I, <laughs> I, I expect it to be lighter. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's like ink. So mm. I thought there's a common misconception with Lambrusco, but it's actually a family of grapes. Um, so there's not just a single type of Lambrusco, there's actually a whole bunch. So you can find like quite light, quite bright uh, Lambrusco made in the sweetest style, um, or you can find Lambrusco made as a dry table wine mm. in Emilia Romagna in Italy, and it'll look you know much more similar to this. Yeah. But this colour is just, you know, it's knockout. Yeah. You see it cover the glass and the whole glass turns pink <laughs> before you even get the legs. <laughs> and so this has been in barrel as well because it's part of your um, ferment range? Yeah, so all of our reds have seen barrel actually. Is that how it's, Lambrusco would traditionally be made? So there's different, different regions of Lambrusco producers in Emilia Romagna and they make it in different ways. Right. I think the one that you know, we're all most familiar with was around a couple, mm, what, two decades, three decades ago? Like, <laughs> but it's the sweet bubbly stuff. Yes. And there is absolutely a time and a place for that yeah. and I have no interest in people slagging that one no, because yeah, I think yeah, it's an yeah. incredibly festive amazing drink especially when you get like the really well-made stuff from mm. Emilia Romagna but there's also the other versions of it mm. and it, it's really quite diverse so yeah. you can have like a lighter red wine that's table wine and it can go all the way up to this kind of version yeah. where it's a bit heavier and you know way more impact and definitely that wow factor when you have a look at it. And to me, with this one on the nose, like I just, yeah, you get that like tobacco-y, leathery yeah. kind of undernote to it. But also, like you get some of those like dried herbs. Oh, yeah. You might get like you know oregano and sage and things like that too, which I think is such an amazing you know food pairing with yeah. anything. If you have you know any kind of meats or like uh, mushroom dishes, things like that, to have all of those flavors complement is just ah oh, so blockbuster. That is lovely. Mm. 
Yeah, I would never have picked that as a, L- a Lambrusco. No, no, definitely no. not. It's, <laughs> it's definitely like the a different interpretation of the variety yeah. just to give it new life. And I suppose dealing with preconceived conceptions of how a wine is made and you know should taste and then exploring that yeah. and thinking, well, actually, this is actually made in a whole bunch of different ways around the world and maybe we should you know push the boundaries of expression mm. Mm. and do something unique. Yeah, no, that's delicious. We also do a cider tasting as well. So in the same way that we make wine on site, um, up here we also make cider. Very, very similar to winemaking. Is that come <laughs> from the Granite Belt? Because that's a massive apple um, yeah. district there. So all of the apples for our ciders come from out of Granite Belt, um, and we do four different ciders. So we do a Pink Lady, a Granny Smith, we do an apple and ginger, and then we also do a rosé cider. So that's got a little bit of wine in it to give wow. it a beautiful pink blush. The name I heard came about by... Um the branches or the tree branches? That's a really, really cute story, actually. Back in the day, um, Mount Tambourine was mostly uh, dairy land. And there was a family that lived up the top just behind here. And it was the little girl's job to go and round up the cattle of an evening. She used to go and round up the cattle and she'd have to walk down to the bottom of the waterfall that um, perches just off the west-facing side of the cliff. And she would, you know, go from the bottom of the waterfall, calling all the cows back home um, as it was, you know, the sun was setting. And as she was doing that, sunset up here is, or dusk, that twilight time, is very, very special up here because we're in a rainforest and the forest just comes alive. So you have all of the birds and bats and frogs and insects just making this incredible deafening chorus. Um, and apparently she would hear that and think it was like the, the witches at like witching hour oh, wow. kind of thing as she was bringing the cows home poor thing must have been terrified, terrified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. but that's what coined the name um, so that waterfall is now called Witch's Falls thank you so much this has been really wonderful thank you very much for your time oh, I appreciate it thank you for the it. conversation it was lovely to talk about it other things to see and do these are just two of the cellar doors in the region there are a bunch of others located nearby Witches Fall also do grazing platters and oyster nights in the warmer months. Nearby is a microbrewery called Fortitude Brewing and there's also Cauldron Estate Distillery on the mountain. If you've got kids to occupy, you should definitely check out the Glowworm Cave and Frog Hollow at Cedar Creek Estate and Winery. Also on Mount Tambourine, there is a rainforest skywalk. There's also an activity park called Thunderbird Park, which has a little mini excavator sites and a mini golf course. There's also a campsite there. Mount Tambourine is less than an hour from the Gold Coast and all the beach and theme park activities that that offers. Mount Tambourine is on the edge of the scenic rim, which is quite a large area. If you're up for a bit more driving, some other activities that you can find in the scenic rim area include the Kurumba Lavender Farm, the Towery Sheep Cheese Dairy and Homestead, where you can take part in cheese making workshops for all ages. A different type of dairy is the Summerland Camel Dairy, where you can try a Camel Milk Gelato, a Camel Chino, and there's also Camel Rides available. All over this region is great bushwalking and hiking in the rainforests. There's O'Reilly's and Lemington National Park nearby too. Check the episode notes for links to everything noted here. So some quick stats in the region. As we've said, it's approximately an hour from the Gold Coast and it's also about an hour from Brisbane. You will need a car to visit. Accommodation, there are tons and tons of bed and breakfasts. There's also the Mount Tambourine Motel, which is located next to the St. Bernard Pub, which is great for a meal. What wines to try? There's no real flagship here, so enjoy whatever they're offering up and just have a great time and enjoy the passion that's gone into it. I think the scenic rim and Gold Coast hinterland is a little bit of a hidden gem that maybe people don't know about. It's sometimes really great to detour a bit from where everybody else is going on holidays and this is the perfect spot. Until next time, happy wine travels. Thank you so much for listening. You can subscribe now to get each episode as they drop. You can also check out this podcast on YouTube and see pictures of the region and the people I've spoken to. 
go to windelust.com.au. That's W-I-N-E-D-E-R-L-U-S-T.com.au for everything discussed today. You can also subscribe to my newsletter to hear all about my upcoming events and other news. Till next time, happy wine travels.